I feel like we're still like, hey, thank you so much. Thank you, band. You guys are, you guys did an awesome job. One more time for our worship team. Thank you guys so much. Hey, I got, I got lots to say today, so buckle up. Look to your favorite neighbor and say, buckle up. And just give a nod to your second choice. Hey, what's up? Give him, a, give him a little, what's up? Hey, thanks for being here today. Hey, you could have been anywhere uh, and done worship, but you chose the Fremont Theater. It's a little chilly, I know. Um, but good news is we're buying a building and we have a heater in our new building. Amen? It's gonna be awesome. We are in the per- process of purchasing uh, the old Johnson Avenue Church of Christ, which is like a mile uh, and a half up the road. It's gonna be our permanent facility. That means more, more, op- more opportunities for, for having men's nights and women's events and, and kids' services and, and serving our community in new ways and creative ways. So um, man, we are at a point in our church story that God is just moving. And I just wanna say thank you for your generosity. Last week we received our legacy offering. And man, you guys showed up. And uh, I was going to have this big drum roll moment and show you the grand total. But then um, I realized a lot of people are still giving. Uh, a lot of people are still giving from charitable, charitable funds. People are uh, transferring some stocks. People are doing moving money around. So people are still giving to our year end offering, our legacy offering. So next week, I'll give you the grand total. I can't wait to update you. It's, it's awesome. God is moving in our midst. And uh, I just want to say thank you guys. So give yourself a round of applause for being generous people. Hey, I got some upcoming events. I want to give you guys a slide. You can take a photo of it. We'll post this on our Instagram story. Uh, whoever's doing our Instagram, uh, by the way, you can tag us on Instagram, and we'll tag. We'll, we will give you a shout out. So if you take a photo today, take a selfie, take a picture of something, tag us on Instagram and on our story, and we'll go ahead and we'll give you a little a little shout out back out there. But um, we'll put this up on our screens. Um, we got legacy offering that's continuing to throughout the month of December, so you can give until year end, and after. That, that. Um, heck, if you want to give after that, I, we, will, we will receive whatever money you want to give the church. We're not like, oh, sorry, it's over the, after the new year. Nope. Uh, but we do believe, because we're, we're trying to do as much as we can in this first uh, phase one of fundraising so that we can really get in there and uh, acquire the building and then start uh, renovation. So um, that's happening. Christmas Eve at Active Church, as Ali said, uh, we're having a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a candlelight service. And I remember being like, I can literally go back in my mind to being like a six-year-old kid at St. Philip's Catholic Church on Stockdale Highway in Bakersfield, California. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, come on, anyone remember when women had big hair, higher the hair, closer to God, right? And uh, I remember almost lighting a lady's hair on fire in mass. So little ones will not be receiving a candle this year. You'll get a glow stick, Okay. Uh, it is going to be a family style service, so bring your kids, bring your family, and it's going to be one hour. Everyone say one hour. You're like, all right, I'm, I won't preach, I promise. I'll just give us a nice encouraging message. No, I, I will have a message for you. It's going to be good. And bring a friend, bring a family member, come out, worship with us for one hour, 4.30 to 5.30 on Christmas Eve. And then we got some other things happening. Um, also, Sunday, mark your calendar. Church is moving online only for one weekend. That's 1226. So Sunday the 26th will be church online only. And then the following weekend in January, can you believe we're in 2022 almost? Uh, January 2nd, 2022, which sounds like the future, right? Um, it just sounds so few. You know, the year 2022, uh, we will be in back in the house on the, 20, on the 2nd of January. You got it? So church online and then, okay, cool. All right, you guys, you guys ready for the word today? All right, cool. Um, well, we're going to read the Bible. <laughs> and I'm going to pray that God moves in a mighty way right now. Um, we are starting a brand new series today called The Gift Exchange. And I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but first, let me go ahead and pray and we'll jump right in. Father, we love you so much. God, would you bless this time? Speak through me now. Holy Spirit, move, have your way. Let us walk out of here uh, just encouraged, challenged, and changed. And I pray, Lord, that we would, um, we would draw close to you now, Lord, and in return, draw, draw near to us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. How many of you guys like gift exchanges? Raise your hand. If you, raise your hand if you've ever been to a gift exchange. Okay, we've all, most of us have been there. You call them white elephant gift exchanges, right? That, some people call them dirty Santas, which I just think sounds weird, okay? 
we're going to have a dirty Santa. I'm like, no, that's just creepy. No, just don't call it dirty Santa. Um, unless you like that uh, sort of thing, dirty Santa. Um, but it's just kind of, uh, gift exchanges are cool because here's why they're cool. They're cool because you get to see the best of people show up and the charitable people, oh, you can have it, I don't care, you know? Because here's how it works. You grab a number, everyone gets a number, and then you, you pick, you all put your gifts out and you, you're, they're wrapped up and then you bring, you grab a gift and then you open it up. And sometimes there's like a $20, like, hey, we want to be like a $20 limit. Some people go above and beyond. They get like a $50 gift. You're like, oh, and you, you see someone open that gift. You're like, I want that. I, I want that. Actually, I, like you brought something kind of janky and then like you see their awesome gift. You're like, I'm about to come up right now, <laughs> right? And my wife, uh, Stacy, I love her. My wife is the most nurturing, caring person. I love her, she's so sweet. But something happens to her when the gift exchange goes down. She becomes like a strategic, it's a monetary situation. She's like, okay, they can only be stolen three times, right? And she starts planning with me. Like if you steal it, then they're gonna steal it. And then I'll steal it for the win and we'll lock it in. So she gets crazy when the gift exchange comes around and it's awesome. I love it. I'm like, yes, go babe. Because we're competitive. We like to win. But here's the thing, like, it, like it's funny, like if you have a really bad gift, you're like, suddenly you're like the QVC spokesperson. You're like, and this beautiful towel set, you want this. And, and if you have something good, you kind of tuck it away and you try to hide it. And everyone's like, come on, come on. But here's the thing. This season, it's about, there is a lot of gifts being exchanged. There's a lot of things happening. Uh, a lot of presents being bought. A lot of Amazon wish lists going down, right? How many of you guys bought your stuff on Amazon this year? How many of you guys just like, like, why would I ever go? Like, that's, yeah, it's awesome. It's super easy. But I want to talk to you today about a different type of exchange. I want to talk to you because we are in a very stressful season. Can we be honest? This is just a stressful time of year. Um, statistics show us that depression rates go up this time of year. And we're like, wait, God, you're the Prince of Peace. You're supposed to be Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came into this world. This is the Advent season. This is the time of year where we should reflect on the beauty and the majesty of who Jesus is. But, 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 but for whatever reason, this time of year, it can be really, really fun. And I love this time of year, but it can also bring with it some unnecessary stress and anxiety and worry. And maybe you felt that this week. Maybe you feel that right now. Maybe there's something on your mind in this season that you're going, man, this is causing me stress and I'm worried about it. Jesus wants us to exchange our worry and give us peace. And I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes today about that because Jesus addressed worry quite a bit. And I know sometimes you come to church and you're like, you know, you, you learn about something, you're like, that's great, that's great. And you understand the context of what Jesus was teaching and you're like, or what the epistles are teaching or what Paul was talking about. But you're like, yeah, but how does this like, how does this affect me? Like, how do I take this message and synthesize it into my everyday life. So today's message is gonna be very practical. If you were with us last week, I talked about, does the church matter? And it was very, very high level, like, does this thing, the church matter? I wanna get super practical because you are, some of you are stressed out of your minds right now. Raise your hand, be honest, we're at church. This only works if you participate, so don't be, don't be like, oh, I don't wanna do it. Like, just participate. And if you don't participate, God knows your heart, okay? Um, Raise your hand if, if you're experiencing some stress in this season. Raise your hand. Okay, look at everyone that's not raising their hand. Either you need to ask them advice, like, hey, how are you living this? Like, what are you doing? Or just look at them and say, you're a liar. You're a liar. <laughs> Raise your hand if the person you're sitting next to is causing your stress, okay? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, oh, we're having a marriage series next month. Uh, We're gonna be in this series for three weeks and we're calling it the gift exchange. And we're gonna, each week we're looking at something that God wants to exchange uh, for us. Week one, we're talking about giving God our worry. He'll give us peace. Week two, next week, we'll talk about giving God your hurts. 
your, 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 those things that hurt you and he'll give you healing because God wants to be a healing God. Jesus didn't just, didn't just come to, to be into the world just to be our savior. He wanted to give his life and life to the fullest. He wanted to, to be a physician to heal those emotional parts of your life that you're, are still broken and those parts of your life that still, you know, you look back on, you have memories, you think about how you, you know, maybe it's a, a thought or a behavior and you're like, I still struggle in this area. God's like, I want to heal that place. And then finally, we'll talk about giving God your grief and he'll exchange it for joy. And so today we're talking about worry. So let me, let me first address this idea or kind of identify some clarification. Uh, there's a difference between worry and caution. So sometimes we hear in the Bible like, okay, I'm not supposed to worry about stuff. And so we end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. When, when God's principles throughout the word of God, we, we see that we're supposed to plan and prepare. We're not, we're not like to be like the, it talks about don't be like the slugger, little, little slugger, the little folding of the hands, a little, little napping here. And then all of a sudden it says like poverty will strike you. Uh, it says like, look at the ant, Proverbs says, look at the ant, it works, it stores up. Like, so there's a principle in the Bible that we're not to worry, but we're also not to just kick our feet up and go, well, whatever happens, happens, man. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm just, gonna let live and let live like no that's not what God is talking about when he addresses this topic of worry um, we're not talking about just being you know uh, just being unwise we're talking about not worrying and some of us today worrying is causing us we're losing something and I want to talk about what we're losing uh, another clarification I want to talk about real quick Perhaps maybe some of you are clinically depressed and you're here today and it was a struggle for you to get out of bed. And I'm just, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I know for some of you, it's hard to be around people. And I'm a people person. And to be honest, sometimes it's hard for me to be around people, especially when I'm going through something. And do you ever like avoid a situation because you're like, I don't want to have to do all the small talk. Or sometimes you want to be at church, but then you don't want to talk to people. It's kind of weird. You're like, I want to be at church, but I don't want to be around a bunch of people. Some of you are watching online right now. You're like, that was me. I, I'm at home. Thank you for being here online. But something happens when you get around other people. And I, I just think that I don't want you to like hear this sermon and go, oh, maybe you have some chemical imbalance. Maybe there's things you're struggling with. You're trying to take medicine, the doctor. Like, I believe God can heal you through that way. But I, I, I just want to lean in today because I do believe that most often times, there's something that God wants to address that is, is, that he is able to do, okay? Like you might say, well, a doctor told me I have this kind of thing going on. I'm here to tell you, I serve a great physician. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Whatever he says is the final word. And maybe the doctors, listen to the doctors, but don't ever discredit God from doing a miracle in your life and supernaturally healing that depression or anxiety. I think a word from God, an encounter with God can change everything, okay? So I, I, I believe... I believe that God wants to speak to us this morning. So here's a definition of worry, my definition. Here it is. Worry is allowing your mind to dwell on potentially negative outcomes. Watch this, beyond your actual control. So you and I have control over certain things. And I think that God's saying, yeah, work the field. Yeah, get ready. Like, you know, sow some seeds, do the things that you can only do, but then trust me for the things that only I can do. And, and this is where we get it mixed up. We often worry about the things that we have the least control about, don't we? What about my retirement? What about my kids? What about what's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen to our nation? What's going to happen to our, uh, you know, our family? What's going to happen to, to, uh, to my health? What, what's going to happen? And I think the last two years, I think, the, I think a lot of us have been, you know, inundated with messaging uh, from all sorts of angles, whether it's be the news, whether it's, you know, some of you guys just need to turn off that app. Whatever that app is, just turn it off. And I think you should be informed, but some of us are so glued to our news feed and so glued to Twitter that we think like the world is falling apart and there's nothing we can do about it. Guess what? Last I checked, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he never changes. Institutions will change, government will change, power will change, but God never, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you're gonna put your focus somewhere, probably best to put it on God. Jesus addressed worry like this in the Sermon on the Mount. This is an important sermon. Jesus addressed worry in this. I'm gonna read to you Matthew chapter, 12, chapter six, 
verses 25 to 34. I'll read it all the way through, and then we'll come back, take some observations. I'll give you three points, and then we'll go eat some tri-tip. Sound good? I always want tri-tip, by the way. All right, here we go. Matthew, 20, Matthew 6, 25. That is why I tell you to not worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food? <laughs> and your body more than clothing? Pause. I'll talk a little bit and then I'll just kind of explain. In this context, in the first century, remember, the Bible isn't like, what does this mean to me all the time? Like, you know, like <laughs> sometimes like, well, it means to me. It's like, no, no, no. It actually meant something to the original uh, hearer of the word. Like there's context. So we read content in context. There's principles for days. You can apply a lot of these principles, but you can't just automatically go, what does this apply to my life? You have to understand Jesus was talking to first century uh, middle class, lower, lower, like, Low income people, most part, there's, there's kind of like two classes here and these people lived hand to mouth. So they were always worried about like, there was no Costco. There was no big box store. There was no Amazon. There was nothing. It was like, I have to go figure out how to eat today, Jesus. Like we're hungry. Like many of them followed Jesus because they heard like, dude, did you hear he fed like 20,000 people? I go here for lunch, bro. Like I'm about to get, I'm about to eat. And you know it was good. You know it was good. No, no, Jesus is saying, hey, hey, I know you have real concerns and, and I know you're worried about your food and I know you're worried about clothing too because clothing, again, there was no marshals. Hashtag, where are my, where are my what, people that like, like a good deal, right? Like, why would I spend 40 bucks for a shirt when I gotta buy it for $7 at Ross? It's a little plug for Ross, I don't know. He's saying, I know you're concerned about your clothing because clothing is expensive and you can't just go buy clothes. He's saying your priorities are not bad. They're actually good things. But he's like, this is not, this is not the main thing. And I'm here to tell you today, maybe your concerns have been having enough money to meet, to meet the needs of this current season. Or maybe it's having enough time because when you're at work, you keep thinking about your family. And then when you're at f with your family, you keep thinking about work. And so you're worried about and stressed out, how can I get enough work done so I can be with my family? But when with your family, you're thinking about how can I get my work done so I can support my family? And you're not enjoying either. And anxiety will well up. And Jesus is like, hey, whatever you're worrying about, don't worry about it. Whether you have enough food to drink, enough clothes, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than those birds? To which we go, oh yeah, I hope so. He goes, look at this, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store up food in barns and your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Question, can worrying about whatever you're worrying about add a, even an hour to your life? And the, and the answer is, no, it can't. It goes on. And why do you worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all, of his, in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what are we gonna eat? What do we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. Watch this. And he'll give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Watch this. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. I could say nothing else. We could pray and sing a worship song and you'd have enough to go back. I could say, go read that five times every day this week and come back next week. How did it work out? And if you did that, you would see God, you would see more of God in your life today. But I have a couple thoughts I wanna share with you about this section of scripture. So here's the first thing I wanna talk about. Um, he says a few things about worry here. The first, he says, worry is actually unnatural. 
I used to always be like, no, no, worry is a natural default of the flesh. He actually says, no, no, the way God designed it, the way the perfect design in creation, worry was never intended to be part of the perfect design. And I know we're fallen, we're broken, but he's saying, look at the birds. They're not wondering what they're gonna do for the day. They just do what they have to do for the day. They're not concerned about their retirement. They're not concerned about their, their family. They're just concerned about taking care of what they have to do each day. He's saying worry is kind of counterintuitive to how I created you. You're not called to be a worry wart. And some people, you gotta be careful about how you speak about your life. Because someone told you, oh, you're my worrier. One of your parents said, oh, you're the, wor you're the wor I, here's my anxious one. Here's the one that's always worried. And you thought your whole life, I'm, I'm the, I'm, I, you tell people, yeah, I'm a worrier. Yet your confession about your life and your thought life is, yep, I worry. Guess what? If you keep saying that over your life and you keep saying, saying something that God didn't tell you that you were, because last I checked, my Bible says, man, my God, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and sound mind. He tells us to cast all of our anxiety upon him because why? Because he cares for us. Some of us keep saying, we're the, I'm a warrior, I'm a warrior, I'm a warrior. And eventually, guess what? You're, that's, that's your fate. Yeah, you are a warrior because that's all you think about yourself. You're like, I'm a warrior. Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't worry about that. And he goes on to say, he talks about worrying is unnatural. He talks about um, worry is unhelpful. It doesn't actually change anything. It's like being in neutral in your car and hitting and going and then just hitting the gas and revving it. You will burn gas, but you won't go anywhere. Worry is actually, he asks, can you add even just an hour to your life? by stressing out all day. Does that even do anything? He says, no, of course not. And he goes on to say, worry is actually, he goes, don't be like the pagans, or in this, in this version, he says, don't, he goes, so don't worry about these things, what we'll eat, what we'll drink. He says, because that's what unbelievers do. He's saying, essentially he's saying, don't have the posture like people that have the wrong view of God. Because here's, here's the reality. If you're a Christian, Meaning you've, not meaning you go to church, like it's awesome you go to church, but meaning you've surrendered your life to the will of God. That you've yielded to the spirit of God. You've confessed him as your Lord. And guess what? Confession as Lord and going, raising your hand is awesome. We do that every single service. We'll, we'll give you a chance to, to make a decision for Christ at the end of this service. If you're not a Christian, you want, you're like, man, I wanna give my life to God. But raising your hand is not actually the mark of a Christian, it's a confession of faith, but here, watch this, it's obedience to God's word and doing the things, if anyone does my will, he says, that I'm in him. If, if you do God's will, if you, if you follow Jesus, not saying perfection, not saying sinless, I'm saying someone that actually believes that God is who he is and that he can do what he says he can do. If you believe like that, if you actually live your life like that, then watch this, if you begin to actually think that God is good, he changes the way that you think about him and all of a sudden you're like, wait, wait, the Bible says I'm his son, I'm his daughter. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the heir to the most high God. I actually am royalty. I'm a priest, the Bible says. When you start believing that about yourself and that God's favor's already on you, not like that you can go name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. I'm gonna, whatever I, I'm gonna manifest this into existence. I'm gonna speak this out into the ether and somehow it's gonna come back. No, that's kind of new age. But you actually believe that I'm a child of God. Like if I'm a, my kids, I'll do anything for my kids. And I'm, a, I'm not even that good of a dad compared to God. Man, he loves you. He cares about you. So he goes, it's from this posture that you gotta, don't be like the unbelievers that think that, man, it's, you're on your own, survival of the fittest. Don't be like them because if you do, you'll worry yourself to death. If you do, you'll have no peace. And here's what I'm here to tell you. Many of us are Christians, but yet we're not experiencing the peace of God. And I believe, I, I, here's why I believe it is. I believe that our devotion, our, our point of our greatest devotion will be the source of our biggest emotion. And so whatever you're devoted to the most is actually the thing that's causing you the most stress. 
So what if you flipped the script? What if you, what if you trusted God with the things like your kids, your money, all that? What if you trusted God with that and made your greatest devotion King Jesus? Would it change our situation? I believe so. So here, how, here's the question. How do we give God our worry and experience his peace? If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, I have three points. Let Jesus be king. Let Jesus be king. And for you theological people, I understand he is king, regardless of your, regardless of you acknowledge him as king. What I'm saying is, let him be king of your life. God will only go, he can only work in the places that you allow him to work in. For example, if there's a part of your life that you just say, I'm not, God, this is my stuff over here. I'm cool with you being on Sundays and I'm cool on Tuesday morning Bible study, but everything else, like these areas are off limits. Don't touch that. God's like, well, then I'm not really Lord of your entire life. And I believe you could be saved. I, I believe you could be a, a genuine Christian, but I don't, but here's the reality. If you're not letting Jesus rule and reign over your entire life, then there's parts of your life that are, the enemy's like, okay, I got him right here. You're giving him a foothold when you don't trust him with everything. And you say, I'm, I'm not gonna let Jesus have access to this because I gotta control this because if I don't, then I'm on my own. Now, you do have to, there is a, process of planning and preparing. Don't just, don't just let, kick your feet up and live like, hey, whatever Jesus wants, I'm going to do, and, and I'm not going to save, I'm not going to plan. No, plan for the future, but he's saying, let, let, let me be king of your life. Because here's the reality, when you put God's kingdom first and make God's kingdom's purposes your primary concern, you kind of don't have to worry. All the other things, he says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything else in your life, when you put God as first place, will kind of take care of itself. All the other things will take care of itself. Number two, how do we exchange our worry for peace? Number two, live a day at a time. Live a day at a time. Um, my wife and I were, I was gonna say we're pregnant. Um, it's tough. Um, my wife's pregnant, and she is about 24 weeks this week. And it's been, we've had a couple really sketchy moments where, where the baby wanted to come out too soon, so they had to go in there and do an emergency cerclage. And without sparing you all the details, it was sketchy, okay? And they had to, like, push the baby, like, the water back in her and put her upside down. It was like... And they got him back in. Like the doctor came out, was like, whew, sweating. Like, we got him back in. <laughs> I'm like, thank you, doctor. Like, I just like hugged the doctor. Like, oh my gosh. And uh, so each week is like, is a huge milestone in that baby's development. And we got to get him. He's, he's about a pound and a half right now. She's 24 weeks this week. Each week is a milestone to health. And each week, each day, my wife's like, it's like every day is creeping by. It's so slow. And she's on like bed rest. And so she has to like, just be very careful on what she picks up. She can't be doing too much. And it's like the busy time of year. So she is stressing her out. And I'm like, babe, let's just live it a day at a time. We can't worry about tomorrow. Because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I ask her, did you do everything you knew you could do today? Did you take your prenatal? Did you take your vitamin? Did you take that thing? Did you do what you could do? Yep. And then we just live a day at a time. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. But when you invite God in and you let him be the Lord of your life, the king of your life, and you live each day as a day at a time, the Bible says God will give you enough power and strength for today. The Bible says, Jesus says, hey, pick up your cross daily and come after me. I will, he says, hey, give us this day our daily bread, not weekly bread, not monthly bread, like daily, like your walk with God. Some of us check out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Maybe we'll get in a Bible study. We'll go, we'll read our Bibles. We'll watch a sermon on you know, a certain day. But it's like, we're like, we're walking with God, not, but we're not walking with him daily. God's like, no, 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 live a day at a time and watch as your worry begins to dissipate, as peace begins to infiltrate your life. He gives you strength to deal with what comes for today. I was talking to my pastor recently and we were just chatting about just how to, how to prioritize 
Because, you know, some of the most effective, most influential people, some of the most high-level leaders that you know aren't busy. They're not. As a matter of fact, some of the most, the people that are the most influential, both in the, you know, in the church world, business world, there's a hustle to them, but they're not busy. They do, they make time for what's priorities and they make time for the things that matter most. And so here's the question for you. If you're, if you're stressed out and worried all the time, when's the last time you visited your priority list and what's most important to God in your life? When's the last time you wrote those things out? Here's a challenge for you, and, and this is real practical. Pr- go to prayer this week, heck, pray tonight. And you, if you're married, get your spouse, pray, and ask God to give you four or five things that you, are, you know are in my control. I can do these things. I, don't, I, don't, I can have control over them. What are the four or five things that you could do every single day that you go, I'm gonna do number one first. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do number two, but not until I do number one. And, so, and I'm not gonna do number three until I finish number two. And so on and so What if you said every single day, I'm gonna get a hold of God because without the Holy Spirit empowering me to live this life, without leaning on the power of God, I can do nothing. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get quiet time with God every day. The second thing is I'm gonna make room for the VIPs in my life, the relationship. What if maybe you're stressing out because you're trying to do everything all at once and every single thing seems like a, 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 a priority when really there's probably three or four things you could do before that. What if God wants to help you live a day at a time to give you strength for the moment, for today? And if you said, you know what, God, I've done all that I can do today. I've, I've, I've put all my energy into the things that I can control and the rest, I'm trusting you. What would happen to your anxiety and to your stress if you allowed God to reprioritize what you put your hand to, what you put your mind to? I think it could change, I think it could change radically the way you live and experience your walk with God. And number three, finally, lean on the faithfulness of God. God is so faithful in my life. I rarely, I'm telling you, God, he is so good. And if it was up to me, like I'm so, I look at my life sometimes, I'm like, man, I blew it. I messed up. I, I, there's times where I'm like, I was not faithful. I did not trust you, God. I didn't experience, I, was, I had no peace. But then God shows up so faithfully in my life. And so how do we do that? Here's what we do. We talk to God about the things that are worrying us. Let me ask you, you've asked your friend, you've talked to your best friend, you talked to your, you know, uh, maybe someone that you look up to, you've, you've asked them for advice. When's the last time you went straight to God and said, God, this is what I'm worried about. And then ask God, not just to, you don't have to say, God, take this away. You can say, God, what is it that you're trying to teach me? Because this thing is eating my lunch every day. What is it that you want to do on the inside of me so that I can become stronger in this season? See, prayer is the, is the antidote. And you're like, oh, of course, prayer. I've done that. I tried that. No, you tried it for about three days. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. You have a problem, you pray. I, I took it to God, nothing happened. It's like, yeah, you prayed once, dude. But yeah, but it was a really good prayer. It was, my, it was the best prayer I've ever done, Pastor. I'm like, my pastor once told a story about prayer is like the man that woke up one day and God said, hey, young man, go outside and push that boulder. And the guy's like, dude, that thing weighs like four tons. He's like, go push it. And every day he'd wake up from noon, from morning till night, he pushed the boulder and nothing would happen. He'd, pr- he'd push and push and push and nothing would happen. He did this for a year, two years, three years. Finally, one day he's like, God, I've had it with this boulder. I push on it every single day and it goes nowhere. This thing is not moving. I quit. I'm done. And then God says, okay, 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 that's fine, that's fine. Go over to that smaller boulder over there. And he's like, okay. I Gets down, boom, he pushes the thing right out of the way. It rolls out the way. He's like, wow. God's like, hey, 
look at your arms. He starts looking at his arms. He's like, oh, wow. He's like, see the muscles in your back? Look at the muscles in your leg. Look, look at your body. It's transformed because I told you to do that every day. And because you went to me and you, you, you didn't ask questions, you just went and you pushed. Every single time you were pushing on that thing, even though it didn't look like it was moving, I wasn't really concerned about the boulder. I was more concerned about what was happening with you. And so I just got to tell you today, maybe you're here today, you're like, when I push and I pray and nothing seems to happen, maybe just maybe the problem isn't really what God wants to work on. Maybe just maybe he's more concerned about the character and the person that you're becoming for eternity more than he is about our comfort on this earth. Maybe the problem is actually a gift. <laughs> Maybe, just maybe, the thing that you're asking God to take away is actually the, God, the thing that God is actually using to get you to connect with Him. Maybe, just maybe, your brokenness is actually a bridge to your breakthrough. And when you lean on God's faithfulness, here's what happens, watch this. Philippians says, don't, worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Everyone say everything. You're like, that's easier said than done. I know, I know. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. So Paul is saying in Philippians, look, tell God about it in prayer. So God, this is, I'm worried about this. For me, it's like, God, this little baby, Lord, I want to hold my son. I want to hold a healthy baby when it's time, Lord. I don't know what to do. I can't go in there and, and check on the baby, make sure everything good. Okay, cool. We just got to trust God. So I tell him, and then I thank him for his faithfulness. I thank him for his goodness. I thank him, Lord, that even though I've gone through tough times and even though I've experienced pain, Lord, you've been faithful. Lord, you're a great God. You're an amazing God. You've saved my life. You've delivered me from, from addiction. You've delivered me from thought patterns. God, my life is not, I'm not who I used to be. So God, if you are faithful to transform me and you're faithful to continue the good work that you began in me, then I'm confident that you're faithful to make sure that this baby comes through healthy. And if I don't have a healthy baby, God forbid, then you will meet me in the depths of my despair and you will still be God and you will still be good because I'll praise you when it's raining and I'll praise you when it's good. I'll praise you when it seems like all hope is lost and I'll praise you when I'm on the mountaintop because you're God and that's who I serve. I serve God Almighty and that's the peace. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. And when you do this, tell God what you need and then watch this. Then after you tell God what you need and thank him for what he's already done, then, and what he will do, because he's got promises, and all his promises are what? Yes and amen, come on, we're gonna worship. We just stand to your feet real quick. We're gonna worship, we're gonna sing that song, because here's what the word of God says. Come on, you gotta lean in a little bit right now. Then, watch this, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So whatever you're wor worrying about, let's pray. We're gonna give it to God right now as we go into, into worship. So Father God, <laughs> we need peace right now. So Lord, I pray God, whatever we're struggling with, whatever anxiety we're feeling right now, we lay it at your feet, Lord. We know that we are gonna do our part, but Lord, would you do your part? So would you heal people that are hurting right now? Would you, would you fix broken marriages? Would you give hope to those that are hopeless? Would you give joy to those that are feeling depression? In Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing out. In your promises, my confidence, it's your faithfulness, and I will rest. In your promises, my confidence, is your faithfulness.
faith rising a little bit in your heart? Man, I hope you're inspired to believe God for more this week, to yeah. give Him your stress, to give Him your anxiety, and watch, watch. Here's what I'm asking you to do. You should read Matthew chapter 6, 24 through 35. Read that this week. Read it like every morning, okay? Wake up. I know you got your Bible study. You might have your YouVersion app. Just take, it'll take you like literally less than a minute. Read that every single day. And here's what I want you to do, just for a day, just for one day. Tell God what you're worried about. Instead of, instead of stressing about it, instead of laboring, like worrying about it, giving it so much energy, God's like, does that really get you anywhere? Instead, pray about it, talk to God about it, and then thank Him in advance for moving in your life. Thank Him in advance for saying, God, you did it then, you'll do it again. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have to wonder if you're for me. I already know that you're for me because the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet far off from God, Christ died for you. So pro proclaim his goodness, tell him what you need, thank him in advance, and then give him your gratitude. And here's what I'm telling you. If, if you will do this every day, your problems won't go away, okay? You'll still have problems. But your peace will begin to flow again. The peace that surpasses understanding. I don't know about you, but I need peace that doesn't make sense type of peace. Because I'm, I know that I need God every single day. There's a great, great quote by Matthew Barnett. He's the leader of the LA Dream Center. Helps tens of thousands of people get off the streets and get them out of, uh, you, know, dr you know, drugs and alcohol and into sober living and then help them with jobs. It's, it's incredible what they're doing in LA. And he asks this question to anyone that is struggling, whether it be struggling with some serious stuff or struggling with just with stress and anxiety. He says, hey, what do you need to do in this season? And they'll tell him, and for us, it's gonna be, we need to pray and give it to God. And then we need to thank him for his goodness. And here's what he asks, okay. Can you do that for a day? Can you do it for one day? Not for the rest of your life, not for the rest of the month, not for the rest of the week. Can you do it for one day? I'm here to ask us, our church, can we just go to God with the things that are worrying us? Can we just do that for one day? And you're going, what about tomorrow? Don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> it has enough worries of its own. So just focus on today. Could you do it for a day? I think, I think if you did it for one day, can you do it for one day? I think God would work in your life. You would begin to see the faithfulness and the peace of God that surpasses understanding. That's what I want for you in this season. What's the great exchange? What's the gift exchange? God's peace for your worry. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. I thank you for times like this that remind us that you're a good God in spite of what's happening in the world, what's, in spite of what's going on with what seems like an ongoing and never ending pandemic. And depending on who you listen to, you're, you're getting all these conflicted messages. And Lord, we know that you're faithful. We know that you're good in spite of what's happening on the news or what's happening in the world. So today, God, we surrender our lives to you. We give you our worry. We'll gi we give you our anxiety in exchange. Lord, we ask for your peace to come that surpasses understanding, the Prince of Peace, that you would reign and rule in our lives, God, that you would be the King of our hearts. And as we do that, Lord, we would, we would stand firm, Lord, knowing that we've done all that we can do. And Lord, that now you're working on our behalf. With eyes closed and heads bowed, I wanna to speak to someone in here today. Maybe you're here today, you've never had the greatest gift of all. You've never received the free gift of God, which is forgiveness of your sins in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God, that's hell. But the gift of God is this, eternal life in Christ, that the grace of God the forgiveness of God is actually a gift. You don't earn it. You don't, you don't deserve it. It's a gift given to you freely. And the, the best way to receive a gift is simply to receive it, to open it and say, God, this is mine. I receive this gift. But 
God will not barge into your life. You have to receive him as your savior, as a gift. You have to receive the gift of salvation. And you can only do that by confessing him as your Lord and giving him the rights to your life. Saying, God, I surrender it to you. You paid it all for me. Now I sacrifice my life. I give it all back to you. And if you do that, the Bible says, you will have new life in Christ. That your past will be redeemed. Your future will be secure. All because of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago years ago. And I'm here to offer you that right now by simply asking you, would, will you put your faith in Christ? Will you exchange all of your sin and return? Will you receive all the forgiveness and newness of life in Christ? That's, your, that's the gift that God wants to give you today. And it starts with a prayer. So if you want to be led in that prayer, I want to simply ask you, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you want to receive Christ today, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand boldly. Just say, that's me. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to lead you in a prayer. On the count of three, if that's you, raise your hand. One, two, three. Just pop your hand up. Say, pray for me, pastor. That's me. That's me. Amen. God sees your hand. Amen. God sees your hand in the back. Amen. God sees your hand, ma'am. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. Say, pray for me, pastor. Include me in that prayer. I want to be, I want to be with Christ. Let's pray this together, church. Nobody prays alone. Say this out loud. Even if you didn't raise your hand, let's just pray this together. Say this out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, but today I'm forgiven because of Jesus. So today I surrender my life to you. Make me new. Fill me with the Holy Spirit all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Come on, let's give it up for everyone that made that decision. So good, so good.